Turn with me this morning in your Bible to Romans chapter 5. Now, as you're turning to the place, it will be my intention, the start of January, probably the second week of January, we'll commence a series of expository studies on the book of Daniel. I would encourage you to remember that, please, in prayer. I'd thought of maybe starting today, but then we've Remembrance Sunday, and I'm off a Sunday, and then we're into Christmas, and I thought, well, we leave it to uh, January. Let's turn to Romans 5, and we're going to read together the first 11 verses. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work of patience, patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad on our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if... When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 11. And we pray that God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text this morning is taken from Romans chapter 5 and the verse 5. It reads as follows. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And my theme today is entitled, Focusing on the Love of God in Christ. So here's the text, Romans 5 and 5. Here's the theme, Focusing on the Love of God in Christ. Now I believe that in Romans 5 and 5, the Apostle Paul introduces us to one of the greatest themes in the whole of the Bible, but also one of the greatest themes in the whole of the world, namely the love of God. Now, he just doesn't mention this subject. It's not merely a single subject that he's introduced. It's a subject he's introduced to reinforce his argument of the believer's absolute Security in Christ. You see, prior to Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul has been expounding what the gospel is. He has shown the need of a full and free and forever justification. And then he's introduced us to the ground of that um, justification. Listen to these words in Romans 3 and 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And now, having explained the ground of a full and free and forever justification, he wants us to understand the effects or the results of that justification, or the effects or result of the gospel. So, so get in your mind the need of the gospel, the ground of the gospel, and here's now the effect and the results of the gospel. 
You see, every true born-again believer has a new standing before God in Christ as a result of being born again of the Spirit, as a result of being brought into Christ. They have now been legally declared righteous before God. They're now treated as such by God. They now have a full and free and forever justification. And of course, the ground of this new standing before God is not our own works, but it's the exclusive merit and mediation of the Lord Jesus himself. And on the basis of the believer having the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to them by faith alone, the result is that they now have peace with God. Isn't that what Romans 5 and 1 says? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessedness it is to have peace with God. You think of a man who believes the gospel. He's come to understand his need of God's salvation, the need of a full, free, forever justification. He has seen his sin. He now turns to Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. He calls on him to, 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 so, so that he might be wonderfully saved and converted. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that man not only now has been gifted the gift of peace with God, but he's also assured of an eternal security in Christ. And that's what Romans chapter 5 says. Verses 1 to 11 is all about. Every believer has the power and the ability to prove the effectiveness of the gospel, even in the most difficult of circumstances. Look at verse 2. By whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Listen to verse 3. But not only so, but we also glory in tribulations also. Now, how could Paul say that? Think of it. He's really saying, we're boasting in our tribulations. All the trials and troubles that come into our lives, all the darkness, all the distresses, all the disappointments, the despair, all the doubts. Now, because there's a wonderful power to prove that the gospel works even in the most difficult of circumstances. Paul knows that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and peace and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame. Why? Because this hope will never let you down. This hope will never put you to shame. This hope will never disappoint you. You see, here's a very positive statement. I believe this is a truthful statement, an absolute statement, a very secure statement. Paul is continuing his line of argument that because of the believer's security in Christ, this hope that he has makes us not ashamed. Now, you see, this is not pie-in-the-sky stuff. This is not something that's vague, something that's humbug. This is not something that's wishful thinking. This hope that maketh not ashamed is sure and certain. It's 100% guaranteed. It's going to happen. Many Christians, myself included, haven't really grasped the, 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 the full reality of enjoying peace with God. We don't really glory in our tribulations. We're not really gripped with this surety of this certain hope. And, and many of us haven't entered into the experience uh, and, and we haven't occupied this ground. Why? Because of our hearts. Because of coldness. Because of lightheartedness. Because of indifference. Because of callousness in our approach to God. And therefore many of us Lack real, true security in Christ. You see, is there someone here who doubts God this morning? God's existence? Maybe you doubt whether the Bible's really true. And, and, and you have many other doubts besides. Maybe you're, you're even professing to be saved, but you'll doubt if you'll, you'll ever really end up in heaven. Could, could in that last day, you, you maybe think to yourself, could I end up in hell? Paul says that could never happen to one in Christ. Why? Why? 
Because this hope in Christ makes you not ashamed. Why does it not make you ashamed? Well, here's the answer. Listen to this text. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. See, grasp what the Apostle Paul is saying here. God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit imbibes every believer, indwells every believer. The Holy Spirit can also infill every believer. And the Holy Spirit, God's gift to us, has poured into our hearts the love of God. And, and this, of course, is a real experience. I believe it, it happens um, at conversion. So, so we can say it's a past experience. But it's also, I believe, an ongoing experience. Remember, it was the love of God that led the Lord Jesus to die on the cross for us. To rise again for us. It's not what he says in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8. But God commended his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And oh, that we could grasp something. This is what I've been praying about for myself. That I could grasp something of the reality of the love of God in Christ. You see, when we think of the love of God in Christ, surely this is something wonderful. This is something that's truly amazing. Something that's immeasurable. Something that's immovable. Something that's mind-blowing and mind-boggling. Every believer in Christ has a remarkable security. And if we could grasp that, if we could begin to understand that, ponder that, consider that, if we could grasp more of the love of God in Christ and think of his interest in us, think of his intention for us, think of his indulgences of us, what a difference that would make in our lives. I believe it would be revolutionary. I preached at Ballycoan Harvest on the thought, Jesus loves me. And if we're gripped by the fact that God loves us, with a sovereign interest and a sovereign intention and a sovereign indulgence of us, what a difference that would make in our lives. Now, now that's what we want to think about. We're going to focus on the love of God in Christ uh, from, from this text. Three things. Uh, the source of the love of God. Now, how do we know that our hope in Christ maketh us not ashamed? Well, here's the answer. God has given us the Holy Spirit. The love of God is the Holy Spirit's argument for the eternal security of every believer in Christ. Turn over there to Romans chapter 8 and look with me at verse 9. Paul says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You see, a true believer is one who's born again of the Holy Spirit. He's been savingly joined to Christ. He, he has been put into Christ. And he's not only born of the Spirit, but he's indwelt by the Spirit. The Spirit of Christ dwells within him. His body has become Christ's temple. And he, of course, can experience the fullness of the Spirit, because the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be being filled. It is, it's in the present continuous tense. Now, I believe this is a vital component in Paul's argument. It's not something we can just skip over or brush past, or, or rush on through. You see, the mention of the Holy Spirit here is not just an afterthought. It's an essential part of proving the security of the believer in Christ. If God has given you his Spirit, Paul is saying, you're born of the Spirit and indwelt by the Spirit. 
and, and your body's now his, then will God in Christ ever damn you? Will God in Christ ever reject you in that last day? Realize because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, you're his. You belong to him. You've been brought into a unique, remarkable, unchangeable relationship. Now, what he does here, he just mentions the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then what he does is, he takes up the theme of the Holy Spirit again in chapter 8. And chapter 8 is really a chapter on the fullness of the Holy Spirit. See, what Paul has a habit of doing in his letters is he, he, he just mentions a great truth. He, he, he just drops it in there, by the way. Uh, and then later on, he, he comes back to it and he, and he takes it up in a, and, and gives a more fuller exposition of what he has just said. And when you read Romans chapter 8, you read many great statements about the Holy Spirit. And of course, I'm not preaching this morning on the person and work of the Holy Spirit, although I do believe that we need to have a series of messages on that theme. But in Romans 5 and 5, he just mentions the Holy Spirit. I want you to see that. And he mentions it in the context. He's thinking about the results of the gospel. The man who saw his need of a full and free and forever justification. A man who has come to understand the ground is the merits and the mediation of Christ of that full and free and forever justification. And what's the result of that? Well, that man is peace with God. That, that man glories in tribulation. That man is a hope that maketh not ashamed. That man's eternally secure in Christ. And here's the proof. God has given us of his spirit. I believe, of course, this is a, a complete event. We're born of the spirit. God has given us of his spirit. Our security, our assurance is well grounded because God has given us of his spirit. Now turn over there to Romans, or sorry, Ephesians, and listen to these two references. We, we read there, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Notice these words, sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You see, the Holy Spirit is God's seal. It's God's pledge. In verse 14, he calls it, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, in Northern Ireland, many of you are familiar with a farming community. And I want you to think about a man, and he's going to buy a tractor. And let's say it's an old tractor. We'll, we'll, we'll maybe say it's, 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 a, it's a little grey Fergie. And, and the, the man that owns it's looking at £1,000, which is a lot of money. Well, what would have happened years ago, and I'm going back 30 and 40 years, a, a farmer who wanted to buy the little grey Fergie, he would have come... And he would have put down a down payment. Let's say he gave a hundred pounds. That that hundred pounds would be a pledge, a, a part payment, and that was looked upon in farming community, uh, and maybe even in law, in a sense of sealing the deal. It was the pledge of the down payment. Well, you see, the Holy Spirit is God's pledge. One day we will enter into the full, eternal fullness of our inheritance in Christ. But now God has given us the pledge, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that we're born of the Spirit, indwelt by the Spirit. We can be filled with the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God's witness to us of something more wonderful that is yet to come. And, and a part of that is that the love of God has been poured into our hearts. Now that's the source of the love of God. If you have the love of God in your heart, 
That love has been produced by the Holy Spirit who indwells you. No man can love God apart from the instrumentality and the working of the Holy Spirit. I want you to see, secondly, I want you to think of the speciality of the love of God in Christ. Let's think of these words. If you look at Romans 5, it says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Now, I believe that this is a real fact. God's love to us. You see, some commentators say that Romans 5 and 5 is a reference to our love to God. Now, now that's a possibility. Uh, Augustine, one of the early fathers, took that view. But when we think of the context, I I believe it's maybe better to think about Not our love to God, but God's love to us. Remember the Bible says, we love him because he first loved us. We only love him because our hearts have been gripped with his love for us. If you look, for example, at the context here, Romans 5 and 8, but God commandeth his love. You see, verse 5, when it talks about the love of God, is talking about his love to us. And the Apostle Paul was gripped and filled and thrilled by the fact of God's love to him. How do I know that? Well, if you look at other references in Romans chapter 8, for example, he says in the verse 35, "'Who shall separate us from the love of Christ?' Do you see that? And then he he gives a list of possibilities. And then he says in verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you turn in your Bible then to um, 2 Corinthians And look at chapter 5 and verse 14. He says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. Do you see that? He mentions the love of Christ again. And then whenever we come to the wonderful book of Galatians, he says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, do you see that? There's the repetition here. He mentions the love of God in Romans 5 and 5. He mentions his love in Romans 5 and 8. He mentions who shall separate us from the love of Christ in Romans chapter 8. He he, he mentions the love of Christ constraineth me. He was taken up, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to ask this morning, what made the Apostle Paul tick? What controlled him as a Christian, as a man of God? What set his soul in fire? It was this. He lived within the shadow of Calvary. His heart was gripped daily with the fact that God loves me in Christ. In fact, I believe it overwhelmed him. Paul is dealing here with justification. He was dealing with the the assurance of our salvation. He's dealing with our security in Christ. He's not dealing with sanctification. That comes a little bit later. But you see, our problem is that our hearts are often cold. That in the Christian life, we're carnal. That, That oftentimes we're full of doubt and despair. We don't walk as we ought. We don't talk as we ought. We don't serve God as we ought. We don't give as we ought. We don't love as we ought. Our, 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 our hearts are, are cold and, 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 and loveless. Why? Because we've got away from Christ. Because we've got away from his cross. Because we've got away from Calvary. What do we need? We need a fresh vision of Christ. We need to realize the fact that God loves me. And God in Christ gave himself for me. And that's one of the great keys to living out the Christian life. What what makes you tick? 
What gets you out of bed in the morning? What, what makes those going outreach and the considered Christ team and Trump the streets and uh, Republic of Ireland for God? What, what made our founding father, the late Dr. Paisley and many others who stood with him, take a stand for truth and righteousness in, 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 in that generation and the need for us to continue to take a stand in our day and generation? Why are men prepared to live and die for Christ? Remember the Apostle Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why? Because he knows that God loves him in Christ. You see, he not only talked about it, but he thought about it. God loves me. And, and, and he triumphed in it. Do you know if we were to study the prayers of the Apostle Paul? Look at Ephesians chapter 3. You'll find one of Paul's great prayers in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to the end. He says in verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And one of his petitions is for the church at Ephesus, listen to these words, verse 19, and to know the love of Christ, which path of knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Know the love of Christ, its breadth, its height, its, its length, its depth. You see, it was a burning reality in Paul's hearts. When Paul got up in the morning to get out of bed, it was the first thought that came into his head. When he got into bed at night and put his head in the pillow, it was the last thought he went to sleep with. You see, this was a, a real, wonderful, immeasurable, incomparable truth for Paul. And I want you to grasp that this morning. This is a real fact. Here's the speciality of God's love. It's factual. God loves me. Don't, don't tell yourself nobody loves you. There's a divine attachment to this. He's given of his spirit. There's a divine affection for us. He sees us as the apple of his eye. We're, we're looked upon as jewels. We're, we're precious to him. I, I've asked the question, what is love? And someone has described it in this way as a full identification with the interests of another and a hundred percent commitment of those interests. You see, that's the kind of love that God has for us. I want you to see also, there's not only a real fact here, but there's a real focus here. If you look at our text, it says, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. By the Holy Ghost. Now, what does that mean, the word shed abroad? I want you to think of the word poured, because that's the meaning of the word shed abroad. I haven't time to go through a number of different references to show you that it's the same word, but you think of God pouring out his spirit in the day of Pentecost. Well, well, that's the idea. And you see, we maybe are thinking this morning of a receptacle, some sort of container, and we, we fill that container in part, and, and that's the idea. Uh, God has, has poured the, the love of God into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, but, but that's not the idea. You see, the word shed abroad speaks of fullness, speaks of an abundance. There, there's a lavishness behind this idea. Remember the little children's chorus, my cup's full and running over. You, you think of your heart and life as a cup. And it's running over because it's brimming full with the love of God. That's the thought. You see, if God daily loads us with benefits regarding our physical and material well-being, is not what Psalm 68, 19 says? Then I want you to remember what he also says in Romans chapter 8. He says in verse um, 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Do, do you see that? All things are yours in Christ. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Second Peter chapter 1 and in the verse 3. 
And remember again what we read in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. God has given us all things that Christ purchased for us in the covenant of redemption. Our peace. Pardon. Perseverance of spirit. Provision of need. The prospect of heaven and home. You see, it's all here. That's the focus. The love of God poured into our hearts. Lavished in an abundance. There's a real firmness here. Think of these words, the love of God. Remember, the love of God is unchangeable. The love of God is unmovable. It's unfluctuating in a changeable world. Why? Do you know why? Here's the answer. God is love. And that's one of his, his, his lovely attributes. That's an essential part of the nature and being of God. God is covenanted. Out of his good pleasure. Connected to the sovereign purpose of his own will. To reveal to us one of his great eternal perfections. And you can trust that love that's unchangeable, that's unmovable, that's unfluctuating in a changeable world. And that love, when it grips your heart, it'll be for your security. Why? Because God says, my counsel shall stand. Oh, that we could see love as part of God's eternal perfection. And God, who is love, has lavished his love upon us. Do you know there's a real fruit here? The love of God. What does that produce? It produces our love to him. I could understand why Augustine just seen it as our love to him. But we have to see his love for us. And what does his love for us produce in our hearts? Well, remember he says in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. And you see, I want to say this morning, and this is not the subject. In fact, this is what I started out thinking about for preaching this morning. And I was led away a different direction. But I want you to think of this because this is important. If the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, there'll be a love for the Savior. Remember uh, writing to Philemon, Philemon verse 5, he talks about thy love toward the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. You see, you can't say you love God if you don't love God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's God incarnate. So there has to be a love for the Lord Jesus. There's a love for the saints. Philemon 5, thy love toward the Lord Jesus Christ and thy saints. And all that that means, a full identification with the interest of a saint and a 100% commitment towards those interests being fulfilled. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. Do you know we shouldn't be hurting each other? We shouldn't be harming each other. We shouldn't be hurting abuse at each other. We shouldn't be stabbing each other in the back. Why? Because the love of God is in our heart. And we have a love for saints. We'll see them as brothers and sisters. And we'll certainly not want to do them harm or hurt them in any way. Neither verbally or physically. There'll be a love for the scriptures. Remember the psalmist said, Oh, how I love thy law. Psalm 119 verse 97. Every word of God is pure. Because it's given to us by the Holy Spirit. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. We love the sanctuary. We, we were singing there, Psalm uh, uh, 122. Uh, about loving the house of God. What about a love for the Sabbath? Calling the Sabbath a delight. Eagerly getting to the house of God. 
to meet with the God of heaven and to worship him in the beauty of holiness and to hear his word and meet with his people. That's all part and parcel. And what about the love for the souls of men? Remember Paul says, the love of Christ constraineth me. The great missionary who, who trekked the, 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 the known world, turning Asia upside down. Why? Because he was gripped with the love of Christ. That's the speciality of the love of God in Christ. Now one final thing. The security of the love of God in Christ. See, Paul's heart was gripped by the love of God in Christ. He not only had a head knowledge, but he had a heart experience. And therefore he had a passionate zeal for living a Christ. This truth was applied to his heart. You, You think of Paul being shipwrecked. You think of Paul being stoned. You think of Paul being scourged, left for dead. You, you think of Paul being betrayed by friends. You think of Paul standing alone for Christ. He said, no man stood with me. And in the midst of it all, how did he cope? He, he was enabled to triumph. He rejoiced even in darkness and despair. Why? Because he had this thought, God loves me in Christ. That was his security. God's love was commended to us. Romans 5 and 8. That's beyond dispute. That's real and genuine. That's something that's worthy to be esteemed. God has presented his love to us and he proved it by the death of his son. John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he did it while we were yet sinners. Did it while we were in a state of ungodliness. Did it when we were enemies. Did it when we were without strength to save ourselves. Here's evidence of God's love. Go to the cross. Think of the death of God's son there. God's love's not only commendable, but God's love to be comprehended. It says in our text, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. If it's produced by the Holy Spirit, then we should experience it. Not, not, Not just a head knowledge, but an intimate knowledge. And this is true of all of God's people. And we could cite many, many individuals this day who were affected by a deep, deep love of God in Christ. Did you know that D.L. Moody was the superintendent of the Sunday school in Chicago? Somebody came up to him after his ministry there, a number of months, or maybe it could have been a few years, and said, Mr. Moody, we're praying for you. And he said, that's good. Well, we're praying for the lack that you have in your ministry. And he was really struck by that. I've got a lack in the ministry. What is it? He, six months after that event, was in Wall Street in New York. And walking down Wall Street, he began to pray. And as he prayed, the Holy Spirit gripped his heart. And the tears flowed. And God revealed himself to Moody in that street in such a way that Moody had to pray after about an hour or two, Lord, stay your hand, because he was overwhelmed with the love of God in Christ. He just, it blew him away. It it was mind-boggling. And from that day, the Holy Spirit set his heart on fire. And you know, that's what we need. Not just to to have this love commended, but, but to comprehend it. And God's love's to be contemplated. Can we enjoy victory? Can we have a joyful Christian experience? The answer is yes. Let's fill our hearts and minds with the fact that God loves us in Christ everlastingly, um, freely, sacrificially, uh, personally, and, and, and continually. You can know joy and victory. You can have hope and confidence, even in tribulation. Maybe there's someone here experiencing sickness. Maybe a deadly disease has come on someone's body in the family circle. Maybe you're here because of circumstances and situations and you're at the point of despair and ready to give up. And you're saying, is there anything could sweeten and help me in my trial? Is there anything to help me in the storms of life? We, we can't change the storms of life. We, 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 we can't stop the trial. But you can lay hold of this truth. You can contemplate this in your mind. God loves me in Christ. We love him because he first loved us. Is that your experience? 
Are you enjoying that spirit of contemplation and reflection? That's our security. And I trust this morning for those of you in Christ that you will begin to focus afresh like never before on the love of God in Christ. Think of its source. Think of the speciality of it. How, how real it is. How focused it ought to be. How, how full it is. How firm it is. And then think about this security. God has commanded. God wants us to comprehend that and to contemplate it so we can enjoy this victory in Jesus. If you're out of Christ, you know you're a sinner. You need to be saved. You must be born again, the Bible says. We would point you to Christ. It's not the church that saves, it's Christ. And Christ alone. Come to Christ. Put your faith and trust in him. And experience this for yourself. May the Lord take these few thoughts and bless them to us this morning.